best friends here today. Oh, but hindi mo sinabi. Many, many go- I had to deviate a little bit from the script. Don't worry. She truly is a genius in the field. She graduated from UP Diliman, where she took a Bachelor of Arts in Psychology, where she was recognized as the most outstanding graduate and her Master's in Clinical Psychology at the Ateneo de Manila University. Now, right now, she's also working as a lecturer in various universities around here and abroad. Now, most notable of them is San Carlos Seminary in Guadalupe, Makati. Now, she has also written many best-selling books, giving advice to women and couples alike. I'm very excited to continue to talk to her as we had a great time talking earlier. Ladies and gentlemen, the famous sex therapist and marriage counselor, our favorite, Dr. Margie Holmes. Father, Father, Dr. There you March. go. I like it. Now that we got that out of the way. I know. <laughs> we had to hurry through it. <laughs> so as you can see, I'm pretty sure that you all know this will be very interesting when we actually start asking our questions. Uh, but with that, do we call on our next guest? Yes, because we have a lot of questions for you later, and I don't want you to, to you know, do this yet. Well, we're going to talk more about that, but... Our next speaker, ladies and gentlemen, won the Ramon Magsaysay Award for Emergent Leadership in 2014. Now, his selfless act of sacrifice as a teacher, traveling through jungles and mountain ranges for seven hours almost actually cost him his life. He would have chosen to be reassigned in a different school, but he was actually moved with passion for the people of Pegalongan, where he stayed and helped the community even beyond the confines of the classroom. He convinced his co-teachers to donate seeds and encouraged the local community to plant fruit trees and vegetables. Now, his motivation was not the pay as a teacher, but the legacy that he would leave behind. You know, legacy it is. What was a dream for the people of Pegalong and now a community of learners transforming their lives by quality education and sustainable livelihood. Ladies and gentlemen, Ramon Magsaysay Awardee, Mr. Randy Halasan. Teacher Randy, nako, natutuwa kami, nandito ka. At uh, nakarating ka. Um, uh, kasi, hindi naman seven hours yung binyahe hindi, niya today. <laughs> hindi rin, hindi rin. Pero kasi mahirap mak- makarating sa kanya. Ang uh, mga text messages, mga mensahe. Um, kasi yung kalapate, pinapalipad pa niya para makarating sa atin yung confirmation niya. No, but really, it, 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 it took a long time to actually invite you and for you to be able to confirm. Can you tell us a little bit more about that communication? It was a last year communication. Matagal na because it is a difficult communication because malimit din akong bumababa sa downtown area ng Davao City. So they to Facebook, through Facebook. So and then, mm, last year pa? Last year po, last year. So matagal, matagal ko din in-accept kasi hindi ko makita. Hindi ko din matanggap. This year ko lang na-confirm. <laughs> so one year po nakarating yung text. <laughs> so... So, kung meron kayong uh, Facebook friend request, expect nyo na one year yung ano, bago, bago ma-accept yung request nyo. Pero natutuwa kami at nakarating ka, pati yung mensahe. But I, I will introduce you to, and Roy, uh, propose already to introduce you to the right people para magkaroon doon ng uh, mas mabuting signal. Kung uh, doon sa bundok na pinupuntahan nyo. But of course, this is really gonna be an inspiring story for all of you to hear later on. But for now, ladies and gentlemen, we'd like to introduce another wonderful personality who will take the stage. Her Filipina beauty and simplicity made it into one of the 12 most beautiful Filipinas. Her beauty did not just capture our hearts, but our tummies as well. She was the mind behind Luso, Shibo, Cafe Bola, Pepato, Sostanza, Healthline, Floridiem, and Grace Park. Honestly, to be, co- just to be completely honest, some of these restaurants have held the best dates of my entire life. 
So thank you, thank you in advance. Now she is really a culinary wizard, proof that passion is key in any successful venture in life. Now, she's also a certified public accountant from Assumption College. Now, business is in their blood as she is the granddaughter of Jose Amado Araneta, the, man, uh, the mind behind the great Smart Araneta Coliseum and, of course, the Araneta Center Complex. With her beauty and passion, we will never know her next venture. But this is what we know. She loves food and time will tell where this love and passion will take her. So, ladies and gentlemen, please uh, help us... Uh, uh, welcome her onto the stage, the gastronomic genius, Margarita Gaeta Araneta Forrest. So, hello and good afternoon. Actually, Father Filoni was just asking for a demonstration yeah. <laughs> of this gastronomic genius. <laughs> no, but yeah, uh, thank you very much, of course, for uh, joining us here uh, oh, this afternoon. Isn't like working? It's working like this. Yeah? yeah. Oh, okay, yes. good. Good evening, everyone. Thank you so much for having me. I'm really excited. Of course, there will be a lot of uh, great questions that will be directed to our second set of panelists uh, a little bit later on. No one can ask about recipes, okay? Yes. Not today. This no, is not can, the forum for that. You can. You can. You can. Willing, okay, wait. I'm very <laughs> willing to share the recipes anytime. Okay, great. Fine. I'm glad you said that. that we got that out of the way. I have a specific <laughs> pasta dish in mind. We'll talk about your pasta dishes later on. Later on. Because we have one more that we'd like to call up here on stage. That's right. I, I, I feel like his entrance will be the most legendary one just yet. Uh, Brian Benitez McClellan is actually a Filipino-American environmentalist consultant. Uh, ecotourism developer and social entrepreneur. He became involved with Gawad Kalinga when he was working on his master's degree in environmental resource management at the University of Pennsylvania. Now, soon after he founded BAM Ecological Technology Incorporated and based himself in Tarla, he named his community members BAM Builders, building the famous BAM bikes or bamboo bikes that not only help his community out, but the environment as well. I saw this band bike and I said I needed to have one and you know we've seen it before a lot of you may have seen it already and right now they're not only environmentally friendly they're also very very stylish and sturdy high quality indeed now he's been here in the country for seven years putting up also guided eco tours around the Intramuros area so can you just imagine if collectively we could all just reduce our carbon footprint just by using these amazing bikes Certainly, of course, it would make a difference. So, ladies and gentlemen, our next guest, may we present the dashing Brian Benitez McClelland riding his gift for our chairman. <laughs> Did I not tell you that he would have the best entrance? <laughs> That was planned. That was totally planned. Wow, Brian, what an entrance. Yeah, that was good. Oh, what an outfit. What's that? What's that around your neck? Uh, this is a bamboo tie. Bamboo tie. We actually make it off the off cuts of our building process. So we want nothing to go to waste. Para walang sayang. Para walang sayang. Sige, meron kang bam bike. Bamboo tie. Ano pang meron ka na gawa sa bamboo? Ah, well, we have lots of bambrillant ideas through our <laughs> bam brainstorming sessions. But you saw one photo before. There's a baby stroller which is in the works, and that brand will be Bam Baby. Uh, <laughs> and then I have a new dog, so I have a puppy, and we're creating stuff for Bam Bow Wow. And <laughs> there's too many. The list can go on. There's just a whole list of bamboo products that he could... Uh, earlier on, we were just speaking about uh, bamboots, since it is a rainy season. No, 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 sorry. Bambooty. Bambooty. 
Yeah, yeah, but that can be interpreted another way. Yeah, well, no, we were talking about the shoes. We were talking about the shoes. All right, all right. <laughs> but obviously, 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 How did you know that you had that calling? Mm -hmm. Well, um, I grew up in a family na hindi religious. So, hindi, hindi kami palasimba, hindi kami papunta simbahan. Nung ako ay third year high school, in, uh, inimbita ko ng isang kaklase sa parokya at uh, napunta ko sa isang parokya that was uh, building a house for disabled children. So, I, I always say, uh, I got to God through the poor. Yung mahirap ay naging tulay sa akin patungo sa Diyos. So, very simple yung decision ko. Nung nasa parokya ako, ang pinakamasayang parte ng araw ko. So, sabi ko sa akin sarili, bakit hindi pwede 24-7 akong masaya? Bakit kailangan pumili ako ng ibang uh, path kung dito ako masaya? Gawin ko ito habang buhay. Father, I know that I... Uh, magta-21, 21 years na ba kayo dito? Yes. Ano yung, uh, meron bang parang one point in, in your stay here in the Philippines na yun yung nagpa-decide talaga sa'yo na, you know what, I, I love it here. This is why I want to be here. Yes. After two years. The first two years, ang pinakamahirap. Uh, kasi bago ang klima, bago ang pagkain, bago ang lengwahe, bago ang kultura. But after two years, I, when I start feeling at home, Um, binigyan ako ng, ng pagkakataon kung gusto ko bumalik sa Argentina para tapusin ang pag-aaral doon o kung gusto ko manatili dito at dito mag-aaral. And that's the time I decided to, to stay in the Philippines. And then uh, many years went by and in 2007 I made the decision to stay for good. So now I'm the diocesan priest, meaning dito ako talagang nakaugat sa Pilipinas for good. Tapos yung iba dyan, gusto umalis. Diba? Nakakahiya naman kay Father. But Father, uh, y- of course, your, your passion and that, that, that want and that need to help the poor is absolutely aligned with your calling uh, from the Lord. And you were telling me that this is truly what makes you happy, right? And you, you just wanted to encourage everyone to find that happiness in helping. That to me left an imprint. Find the happiness in helping. And that's really what, what drives you every single day. Yes. And I think it's what makes a person really happy when you find your, your way of uh, helping others. It might be through uh, music, through arts, through cooking, uh, through teaching, or through being a priest. I think when you find that the life is not just for yourself, it's not your bank account, it's not your house, it's not your name, it's not your position, But kung gaano kang tumulong sa kapwa, at doon talagang natagpuan yung, yung malalim na kaligayahan. And especially for me, working with the poor, especially in my times in Payatas, Commonwealth, and now in Caloocan, nakita mo yung potential ng community. Ang, ang solusyon sa kahirapan ay nasa tao, hindi sa mga politiko, hindi manggagaling sa ibang bansa. Preach. Hindi talaga. Yes. I mean, You can see na may potential at kailangan lang konting inspiration lang. So, I, I find my, my mission as a priest in poor communities is just to inspire and put together the resources, human resources, the dreams. And so, when you have a dream, uh, God works in your team. When you have a dream, things come together and become possible. Even the biggest or seemingly impossible dreams come together. Like, we are building a dialysis center in my parish now for the poor. Nung sa umpisa, sa tingin ng lahat, si Raulo kami. Sa tingin sa sarili, si Raulo din kami. <laughs> Pero ngayon, unti-unti, nakikita mo na posible, doable, and so many people that they are just waiting to die could have hope in the future. So it's just a matter of pulling together resources. And, and that's very happy. So to wake up every day with that challenge and to go to bed so happy, I mean, I'm a lucky man to be a priest. Yeah. Father, I think that, uh, you know, out of uh, 
the panelists that we have today, your challenges are very, very different from you know the challenges that everyday life has. So for you, what 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 are those challenges? Uh, for me, the biggest challenge is uh, to make the community dream high, dream high. Uh, isa sa mga bagay na nangyari sa kahirapan ay ninakawan ng pangarap minsan. So dahil sa araw-araw kumaharap ka sa matinding kahirapan, uh, yung feeling na hindi ko kaya. So yun ang pinaka-challenge. Yung challenge na ibalik yung kapasidad ng mangarap ng malaki, lalong-lalo sa mga kabataan. That's the biggest challenge. When you put the challenge in the community at yung komunidad ay nangangarap na, sky is the limit. Everything can happen in that community. Ang galing po. Gusto ko na pong umalis dito, lumabas at tumulo. <laughs> Actually, I, I want to sit there and just listen. <laughs> no, seriously, but, but thank you, Father. Truly inspiring. I mean, um, I guess uh, you can do all things through Christ who gives you strength. But at the same time, you also have that passion that we can obviously see, we can hear. And the people that you've helped, kaming mga Pilipino ang nagbe-benefit uh, sa tulong ng Pilipinong katulad mo. Salamat. Diba? Salamat. Maraming maraming salamat sa lahat ng ginagawa niyo. Palakpakan muli natin si Father Fayon. Si Dr. Margie Holmes naman, ikaw na. <laughs> Ba't lagi kami? Ba't lagi kami? <laughs> so, 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 Di ba pwedeng may gap in between? <laughs> All right, so Dr. Hose, how did you get into the profession that you're in right now? I mean, is it safe to say that you were very passionate about sex growing up? <laughs> no, I mean, if you really think about it, I mean, most of the people who are here are passionate about what they're doing now. So, you want the, this working, I don't know, you want the burnished truth? <laughs> Uh, sorry, ha, if you're conservative. I still remember when I was in second year college, I fell in love with a married man who made me feel that he was also in love with me. So before I went into it, you know, <laughs> I'm 65, so minus, I was 21 then. Siyempre, yung, yung pinaglakihan ko, yung, ay, walang mag-aasawa sa'yo pag, pag hindi ka na virgin, walang ano. Hindi ako naniwala, but I wanted to be sure. So, naghanap ako ng taong pwede kong kausapin Na, na, <laughs> hindi, hindi kasi alam ko si Father hindi ganyong klase. Na, naghanap ako ng taong pwede kong kaisapin na hindi lang magsasabi ay kasalanan yan sa Diyos. Pero Father, hindi ka ganyang klase. Alam ko po. No? So, parang ayokong malekturan. No? Tapos naghanap ako ng kunwari, pumunta ako dun sa psychiatrist na kunwari psychodynamic, mga very Freudian. Al ayoko naman, naaawa naman ako sa mga magulang ko kung sila ang bintangan. Kasi, because that's, yan ang Freudian theory, no? that you are what you are a lot of times because of your childhood. So naisip ko saan kaya ako pupunta. Then naisip ko, ah, pag lumaki na ako, although malaki na ako dun, Pag malaki na ako, ang gagawin ko ay maging klasing tao na mapupuntahan ng ibang kagaya ko. <laughs> na may pagkapilya, pero mabait naman. Well, <laughs> kunwari. That's the answer. Just, just to get it on record. But <laughs> Dr. Holmes, uh, more than... Though I would love to talk to you about sex and marriage, uh, we, we did get to talk to that talk about that a lot, but I mean, one topic that I would seriously want to take up with Dr. Holmes right here, especially in the presence of all the young people that are here today, is resiliency. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I turn the pages of the newspapers, you, you see it in the news, there, are, there have been a number of uh, items on the news about teenagers taking their own lives. I mean, this is something that you're also very passionate about, to talk about. Uh, can, you, can, you, can you share with us and can you kindly educate, especially the young people that are here today on that topic? Okay, yung alam ko, kasi nag-uusap rin kami ni Father Luciano, na, at marami, yung pinag-usapan namin at hindi kami nag-away. Gusto ko lang malaman ninyo. Okay, taking it from a psychologist's point of view, una, mahira, maraming tao ngayon sa isang suicide case na nagbibintang, binibintang, kunwari ang paralan o kahit ano, mahira, it's a zero-sum game. 
kung gusto nyong maghanap na pagbibintangan, walang mangyayari. Because ang suicide, kagaya ng iyang ibang bagay, is so complicated. No? Uh, kagaya ng pag-ibig, kagaya ng sinong pipilian mo para makipag-sex ka, kagaya ng maraming bagay, parang ginagawa mang sobrang simple kung yan lang ang sasabihin mo na ay dahil ito. Now, going to resilience. Ang resilience, ibig sabihin na kahit hindi ba anong mangyari sa'yo, kunwari malungkot ka, wala kang sense of self kasi OFW ang mga magulang ko, hindi ko sinasabing masama ito because this is a reality of life. Napakahirap who who, sinong makakatulong sa inyo na merong ginawang study, matagal na, ang tinawag is the, invul the invulnerable child. Naghanap sila ng mga bata na iisipin mong talagang magfe-fail. Yung isa si Gloria Steinem, yung nanay niya, schizophrenic. Yung isa naman, yung tatay niya, lagi siyang binubugbog. Yung ano si sinasabi, paano itong mga taong ito, how can they survive? Hindi, hindi totoo na porkit pobre ka, Hindi ba, Father, na kaagad magkukumit ka ng suicide o hindi totoo na if you're rich, you know, you can protect yourself among, you know, against all these things. Suicide, the clinical depression, cuts across all classes, cuts across all intelligence, all professions, etc. So, ang natutunan nila sa itong mga bata na akala nila otherwisely magpapakamatay is that meron at least isang tao na naniwala sa kanila. At maraming nagsasabi kung yung magulang mo talagang lasinggero, etc. Kung meron kang kahit isang tao na naniniwala sa'yo, makakatulong ito. Now, I'm sure, Father, pwedeng, hindi ho ba? A priest, in, you know, like in payata, someone, gaita, I'm sure, you know, uh, you might have a chef, you know, training program. Can, can you imagine how empowering it is? Kung akala mo bali wala ka, tapos merong nakakita sa iyo ng, you know, a, a, a talent, you know, a resource na i walang ibang nakakita. It's empowering, you know, working with bamboo or whatever. Anyway, sorry, ang haba. Sorry. Anyway, <laughs> this is what resilience is. So, ang ibig sabihin ng resilience sana is kahit anong mangyari, ang daming beses ka na palpak, Susubukan mo pa rin, gigising ka pa sa umaga, gagawin mo pa ang pwede mong gawin. At sa aking, in my own personal opinion and my clinical experience, talagang nakakatulong ito. At sana kung mas maintindihan ng mga magulang, masarap magbigay ng pera, syempre kung meron kang pera, peng ang pinakamahalaga is a sense of self-esteem, ang paniniwala sa sarili, no? which will help you nakakatulong sa inyo kahit Anong mangyari o maraming mangyari sa inyo? Mahaba. Sorry. Sorry, mahaba. No, it's great because we're really relating it. This is crafting, thought, leadership. And we're really relating what you in your capacity, what us in our capacities can do to help not just this generation, but the generations to come and to really help uh, future leaders and help bring out the potential in the youth of today. And I'm, I'm so glad that we were able to, to take that out. But I'm sure you guys want to talk about sex. Uh, yeah. <laughs> because, because that's one thing. Because, but, but sex in a way that it talks about relationship. Now, Dr. Marge Holmes is... A lot of people say that you're a sex therapist, but really what it is, is you are a therapist of relationships, yes. right? Yes, or you could say, you know, that tr my training is really clinical psychology. And clinical psychology uh, has to do with problems, not problems of the emotion, problems of thought. And one aspect of it is sex. But there are so many other aspects. A parenting, a jealousy, sibling rivalry, lalo na kung pinag-uusapan yung pagnanakaw ng mana, for example, everything. So this is it. Ha, it, it. Clinical psychology hopes to help a lot of people. And if I may share a saying, first in English, because if I try to translate it in Filipino, it may make me sound, you know, a little bastos, no? I mean, hindi kasi ako marunong magsyadong magsalita sa Pinoy. That they say that, the biggest sex organ is not the one between your legs, but between your ears, you know? And I find that is the same for the biggest heart organ, the biggest organ that makes you, you know, think and that makes you relate to other people, that makes you stick to it and love other people even if they have hurt you. It all has to do with clinical psychology, I think. <laughs> 
Yes, but I think it's great that we get to talk about it in that context, Dr. Margie Holmes. That this is this is that true that that is to be preserved between two people, and we were talking about that. Yes, sorry, nako. I went to my own train of thought. I'm very sorry. Yes, you're absolutely right. That, well, I, you know, I don't want to sound like a priest. <laughs> no, no, no. I'm, you know, I'm teasing, no. But <laughs> partly teasing, partly teasing. No, no, because, uh, you know, I respect everyone. I know Patricia. You have a Bible study group. I respect you. I respect. You know, everyone with their own philosophy, no? And, and their own belief. Let me not call it a philosophy. My own belief is I am not here to judge you and to be moral because it's not my remit, you know? I, I believe in what Thomas Sass says, no? That, you know, when you talk to God, that's prayer. When God talks to you, that's schizophrenia, okay? <laughs> Meaning, who am I thinking about? Heaven? <laughs> you know, so... <laughs> You know, this is by an American psych. This is this first started with an American psychoanalyst, no? Thank you, Father. Tingnan mo magkakampi kami ni Father. Akala niyo. Okay. Now going back. So what I always wanted to do, what I always wanted to do, is share the research. Share the research and always say, you know, a lot of psychologists or a lot of advice columns simply talk about. Their own situation, or say, "Ay, wag mong gawin yung kasi yung yung meron na kung kilala ginawa yon tapos ang sama-sama." So kung wala, don't don't live in with your boyfriend kasi meron na kung kaibigan yun ang nangyare. Don't have a boyfriend. Don't don't be a homosexual kasi meron na kung kilala nagkomit ng suicide. You know, presuming that they're telling the truth. This is anecdotal evidence. No, in fact, it's anecdotal. It's not even evidence. Because ang kailangan niyo ay objective research. Anyway, ito yung gusto ko sa nang gawin. So going back to marriage, no, many people believe in the sanctity of marriage, and I respect them, no. And many people believe that you can only have sex within the the within the relationship of marriage, right? Personally, or clinically. Clinically, not personally. I have to drink. Sorry. Sorry, sorry. I... Clinically, clinically. I have seen, I have helped, I hope, or I have listened. I have listened to many couples who are not married, but yet, and have terrific sex lives, you know, and yet respect each other and love each other. Clinically, though I am not saying, I don't, there have not been studies on what the percentage is, I have met many couples who are married, where either the sex is tedious and tiring, or, or uh, physiologically, technically speaking, the sex might be terrific. The husband may have, you know, what do you call these washboard abs and can last 30 minutes instead of the usual 7 to 10. <laughs> Ay, hindi, matagal na pala yung 7 to 10. I'm sorry, 2? Two, 2 minutes, okay? No, that's true. Okay, sandali. Ay, based on research yan, ha? Not my own research, okay? Based on that. <laughs> darling, <laughs> darling, my husband is there. Yeah, okay. <laughs> then, anyway, okay. So I have also met many married couples who not only have terrible sex, but who do not respect each other. So when someone comes to me, I always say, this is what the, you know, Doctora, pwede ba ho kaming, kailangan po ba kaming magpakasal? And I say, alam mo, ito yung sinasabi ng research. Pero, kung mahalaga sa inyo ang Diyos, right? Hindi ba, Father? If it's important to you, masyadong mahalaga ito para ako, isang psikologistang magsabi nito because it's important to you and I respect that. So, pumunta kayo sa isang expert sa, sa, sa yung nag-aral talaga tungkol sa Diyos. You know what I mean? Na hindi schizophrenic. You know, yung ganung klaseng tao. Pumunta kayo doon kasi ang mabibigay ko lang ay ang aking alam. 
sa agham. Now, if somebody says, um, never mind, masyado ng mahaba. Sorry, maybe later. <laughs> but but, okay. at the, but oh. what at the end of the day is, you, you know, you don't enter into this type of activity if you're not ready. There, there, are, there are a lot of things, you know. It, you have to be married. You have... Father, uh, you have, there, there are a lot of things, but ba basically, this is part of your advocacy. It's really helping relationships. It's helping families become better and down to the individual to help them cope with many things. You know, you're right. Sex is just one aspect, but there are many aspects in society and there are many things that we need to address, the problems of the youth in particular, of families. We need to get rid of that we need to get rid of the cancer in the families that they don't know how to communicate, they don't know how to deal with their problems because at the end of the day, that's what ruins the family unit. Absolutely. Can I say just one last thing? Go. And kailangan rin uh, maunawaan ninyo at tanggapin ninyo na itong concept ng, ng familia, na isang nanay, isang tatay at dalawang 2.5 children, Merong iba-ibang pamilya na nagmamahalan at nagtutulungan na hindi ganun. For example, maraming separated women, binubugbog silang asawa nila, humiwalay sila, more power to them. Sasabihin mo ba, single mother ka, nilalaki mo yung iyong dalawang anak na hindi ito tunay na pamilya? Ah, sasabihin mo ba na dalawang tao na nagmamahalan kahit anong kasarian, no matter what sex they are, ay hindi pamilya porque may nagsabing hindi ito toto, totoong, you know, family. So, ang sinasabi ko lang is, sana unawaan natin at tanggapin natin na maraming ib ibig sabihin sa pamilya, no? At porkit ang pamilya ninyo na may mother, father, 2.5 children, and a little dog, and a picket fence, maganda yon at napakasaya ko para sa inyo. Pero meron ring ibang pamilya na hindi ganon at sana naman mahalin rin ninyo at intindihan ninyo at tanggapin ninyo ang ganito ring family. Okay. Thank you. Alright, uh, we've got Sir Randy. Sir. <laughs> Sorry, I'm still a little... I'm really mahirap from the effects. Mahirap, no? eh, mahirap mag transition. Mahirap mag transition. Mahirap mag Next. <laughs> Hi, Amen. Okay. So, Sir Randy, I mean, obviously, if, if there's anyone here that's really, <laughs> really, like, evidently passionate about something that he does, it's you. I mean, you know, people here, and I'm sure that a lot of the people here in this very audience will will already complain about being stuck in EDSA traffic for like an hour or an hour and a half getting from like Makati to Ortigas. But, but you have gone through so much more than that on a regular basis. San mo nakukuha yung, san mo nakukuha yung drive mo for that? It was my passion, my determination that I want to uplift the lives of the Matic Salad through education. Kasi naawa din ako sa kanila, no? Because yung teacher, yung guru, nagbibigay yan inspirasyon sa lahat ng mga liblib na lugar na hindi naabot po ng pamalaan na malayo po masyado. Through education, nabibigyan po sila ng pag-asa no? and hope that they can survive poverty. So with that, I mean, I'm sure that's a pretty big sacrifice on your part. Are you, were, you, were, you, were you ever a techie ba? Because uh, you said so earlier, the na, it's, it's a little difficult for people to get in touch with you from where you are and it actually like, Took you a year to respond to to the invite that was sent to you today. I mean, is is that something that you sort of like regret letting go of? Also, you I mean, because to a certain degree, you're disconnected from everyone else. Yes, sir. when I was arrived in 2007, when I was arrived there, because as a newly hired teacher, you have no choice. No, you have to assign in a in a rural areas. No, when I signed there, it was a nightmare for me. Sabi ko, two months lang tatanspoy talaga ako. But when I saw the people's eyes that they needed me, the children that needed me, doon ko naisip na hindi ko dapat sila iwan. In spite, I will give them hope and light that they can survive. When I, in 2009, when they held the first ever graduation, alam mo yung toga, nangutang pa talaga ko noon. They cried when they witnessed a toga. It was their first time that they saw a toga. 
doon, yung mga nag-gradik ko noon ng grade 6 in 2009, high school na sila ngayon. Oh, wow. Buti na lang. Yes. Yung, uh, kasi wala pong, that is only elementary po. No? That's why I told the government, if you will not give us a secondary education, lahat po na makatutubo doon, mag-early marriages yan. Mm -hmm. So, I accept the circumstances. Nagtuturo ako ng grade 6, grade 7, and grade 8. Ikaw pa yung principal, ikaw pa yung janitor, <laughs> ikaw pa yung dagalinis ng eskalahan. We were only two, but now we have already eight teachers. So yung reluctancy niya at first to get a, get a job and to accept the job, tapos uh, sinabi mo nga, sandali pa lang, gusto mo na kagad bumalik sa Dava kung saan ka galing. Pero yung passion and sacrifice mo, kakaiba talaga. And what I learned from you is that you want to, you have to be the change yes, in, yes. in that change, in that environment that you want. But more than what you said, hanggang principal, tagalinis, hindi lang sa confines ng school ka tumutulong. Yes, yes. You're a community leader. Tawag ko nga sa'yo, mayor eh. Parang yeah. mayor dun eh. No, but really, he's a community leader and he has spoken to government, he has reached out to government to have bridges built in that community, to have um, other programs in the community, katulad nung pa yes, pagtaniman when, nyo. Yes, when you saw the video that is the Rice and Corn Mills, that is 2000, uh, 12. This time we have already the coffee grinder, the coffee roaster, the multi cup sheller, and the government will give us a shredder and a home economics room. And this time at two hanging bridges, we have already communicated. We have already a meeting with the DPWH. This year will be implemented. And of course, the solar light, you know, the solar, the NGOs will be distributed this coming July through my birthday. Mala chairman. <laughs> that is just an example of going above and beyond the call of duty. I mean, you know, you're there as a teacher, but you end up, like he said, being the janitor, the principal, teaching multiple grades. That's just inspiring. But see, you can be anything in a community. You can be a teacher. You can be the janitor. You can be the chairman. You can be... Well, you can be the psychiatrist in a community, but at the end of the day, it's your passion and the drive to want to change that community. It doesn't matter what you are, what capacity you have. I think it's your heart that really made the difference. Yes, uh, it's the heart, it's the passion that comes with it. Hindi mo pwedeng plastikan, no? Hindi mo pwedeng uh, pakitan tao, no? I want to transform that kind of leadership to my pupils. They want, I want to protect their ancestral land. Kasi kung masyado lang po akong selfish, lahat ng mga lupa doon, kinuha ko na. No? Yes, totoo po yan. Totoo po yan. Because lahat po ng gumagawa ng documents and lahat ng mga papelas, ako po yung lahat. The tribal elders, they just sign. No? Hindi po ako kumuha ng lupa, ng isang, kahit ng isang maliit, wala po talaga. But the passion that I want to have, I want to uplift their lives. Alam mo, pagbaba ko pa sa bahay, 5 a.m., ang dami ng tao dyan. Ang dami ng tao. Kahit one week lang mawala, uh, two days lang, talagang pagdating mo sa diva, talagang yung mga tao talaga. Yun, yun. You know what really got me with Sir Andy's story is that it didn't even originally start out that way. Like what he said earlier, it was something that just sort of clicked. You know what I mean? Like, because I feel that a lot of people, a lot of our future leaders out there, won't exactly know what they want to become or won't exactly know what direction they're heading into. But I guess it's just, you know, when, when times like that happen, it's really just you stepping up to the plate and just being as, as, as passionate, as inspiring, as, as, as much of a leader as Sir Andy is. So can we just give him a huge round of applause? Miss Gaeta. <laughs> No, but obviously you were a public accountant, and then you yeah. you 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 are this gastronomic genius. How do oh you transition? I mean, tell us about your journey from being an accountant to being I, a I kind master of chef. I cringe every time you say I'm a culinary genius. Actually, I don't even like being called a chef because I really never went to formal school. I like to say I'm a cook, and like a foodie who just loves everything about food. And I think my journey started a little over 30 years ago when my 
family was in kind of forced exile um, in New York during the Marcos regime. And um, our whole family was kind of transported there. So we all kind of found ourselves in school and um, finding uh, our interests while we were in New York. And I found myself working with a, an Italian fashion house, Valentino. I mean, very strong Italian brand. And it was a good time to be in New York in the 80s. It was the, the days of Studio 54. My mother was, you know, kind of a very colorful personality who fit right into that whole scenario. And um, I felt quite lucky because it was a, a real nice time. It was also the time that New York was getting Italianized. A lot of people were moving from Italy to New York, setting up businesses because times were not so good in Italy at that time. And I'm, I kind of got impressed with the, the dining scene because after seeing in Manila the, you know, the Italian-American restaurants with the red and white tablecloths and the garlic hanging from the ceiling, that kind of scenario, I, I, all of a sudden I saw Northern Italian, father, right? Northern Italian um, restaurants with the cream sauces and the risottos in New York. And it really kind of made an impression on me. And I was happy in the fashion world, but I think I was happier at nights cooking for my friends and making excuses to invite people over just to try my hand at making pasta. So to make a long story short, 1985 came, my grandfather passed away, and he missed the revolution by three months. So our whole family came home in November, we brought him back, and I wasn't ready to settle in Manila yet. And at that time, I was really kind of looking into getting my, just this urge to find out if the food thing was really what I wanted to do. I would, you know, not only cook, but I would like be, try to be like Martha Stewart, because she was like the hot thing <laughs> at that time. So I would set the table in the fall, I would take dried leaves and put it on top to create this scenario. So that, that was my mindset when I came home in November. So a few months after um, the revolution happened and we found ourselves back in New York and um, my, my cousins and I were actually blessed with the opportunity to help President Aquino state visit and kind of help out. And then I asked my mom, can you give me the chance? I think I wanna go to Italy and see if this is my passion. So I found a teacher um, through a friend of mine who was in design school in Florence. And maybe it's kind of providential because she didn't find a proper form, formal cooking school she found a senora who was teaching out of her home. And that's, that's how I started, and that was my first exposure to Italian cooking. And I think that it's a real blessing because home-style cooking is Italian cooking. So learning from this woman and going to the markets with her in the afternoons and doing language school in the afternoon so I could get really Italianized. You know, father's half Italian, right, father, or full Italian? And I always say maybe I was Italian in my past life as well. So I felt like a homing pigeon. It was all of four months, but I had no Filipino friends, so I was forced to really kind of imbibe the Italian culture. And then I came back to Manila, and um, my first gig, actually, um, was to cook for the, the Lopez family. So it's kind of providential that I'm here at Moralco. It was um, Tito Henny and his children, they were 12, and I did all the cooking by myself, and it kind of like really made me happy. Um, so I guess somebody from my background at that time, that was 1986, 87, you wouldn't find somebody, I mean, with my background kind of working with her hands. So it kind of made good copy. So, um, you know, the Philippine Star ran a whole full page. They had June Delino take my picture because they thought, wow, you know, this, here's this girl that's, you know, slaving herself when she doesn't have to. And um, the, my, I did a cocktail for my sister's 21st birthday. And um, Bubut Kicho, who was the general manager of the Hyatt at that time, saw my food and he says, you know, he goes, why don't you cook at Hugo's? And at that time, Hugo's was like the restaurant. So I said, wow, what an opportunity. So it was really kind of fast-tracked, and um, it became a very public thing. And um, so I did this festival called Italia in Boca at Hugo's. And at that time, only men were in the kitchens, not only of restaurants, but I think of hotels. 
um, as well. They were either Swiss German executive chefs with a lot of Filipino men. So they were kind of like a little traumatized by me with my <laughs> bracelets on my wrist and the long hair with my grandfather's white shirt. And I mean, it was um, a little bit kind of unnerving for them to have this like who they thought was like a spoiled brat, right? So they weren't sure if I could really cook. I mean, it was just a good marketing ploy. So one day, I mean, it's a bit of a long story, but one day I got to the kitchen and there was a Filipino chef who was there. And I said, Bakit ang kapal nitong cream sauce? Sabi niya, ma'am, nilagyan po ni chef ng roux. Sabi ko, roux? So, roux is flour and butter to make a sauce thicker, right? And I, I was taught by my teacher, you never put roux in a cream sauce. I mean, real Italian cream sauce is just butter and cream. So I kind of got really upset and I said, I went to the executive chef and I said, chef, you can't do this. He says, but you know, food cost. Um, so I said, chef, please let me do my cream sauce the right way. So that was it. I forced my, I, I kind of put my foot down and I guess he realized, I guess she knows a little bit about what she's talking about. So to make a long story short, that, that Italian bocca was a hit. They asked me to do another one. And 